time I'm told is usually seven minutes after the, after the hour, but, um, but I'm very, very glad and grateful that we have the guests we do this evening, and I want to very much respect, respect their time, uh, both the time in terms of the time frame of this, of this evening, which will be about an hour or a quarter, but in the larger picture, uh, their time in joining us for this, for this special evening and this conversation. My name is Jonah Steinberg. I'm one of the rabbis here, and I have the honor of being the executive director of Harvard Hillel. And let me first express gratitude to the Israel Caucus at the Kennedy School and to the uh, Jewish Law Students Association at Harvard Law School for joining us in creating uh, the conversation this evening. Um, the conversation, as you know, is what what is security? And we framed it that broadly, I think for two reasons principally. Um, one is that we didn't quite know what the issues of the day would be when we originally scheduled this conversation and so figured that the topic was broad enough that, that this particular group of people would probably find, find relevant things to discuss, but also because the open-endedness of it reflects some of the uncertainty of our times. Uh, I think these are times in which we are asking ourselves anew all sorts of questions about the, uh, the boundaries that we're used to living with, the conventions that we have become accustomed to, and, uh, and where they are and where they're headed. Um, the Mossad in Israel, so far as I know, has had two biblical verses that have been its mottos through the years. They both come from the book of Proverbs. They say almost the same thing. Um, Mr. Pardo probably knows a lot more about the history of the switch from the one to the other. And I'm not sure which is more unsettling and which is more uh, reassuring. The two verses, the first one, which is from the 24th uh, book of the, uh, 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 chapter of the book of Proverbs, from the sixth verse, this is, Ki betach bulot ta'ase lecha milchama, utshu'a berov yo'etz. For with wise counsel shall you make war, and in a multitude of advisors is salvation, is security. And at some point, that verse was, um, was substituted with another one, which is, Be'en tachbulot yipol am uchu aberov yo'etz. Where there is no wise counsel, a people falls, and in a multitude of advisors is salvation. Um, you could have a very interesting philological conversation for the whole evening on the, the meaning of tachbulot. Um, you know, a, a, uh, uh, and I can't resist it as a rabbi and, and something of a philologist for just a second, the, um, the fact that the root traces back to, to both the cords that bind people and ideas together, but also the cords that can become snares and trip us up. Um, and, uh, and when we think of what security is in this day and age, I think on some level we are in a, we are in a conversation about the etymology of this word in a, in a deep way, and perhaps Abishai, who is also very literate in this direction, can, can touch upon that. On, uh, not to put him on the spot too much. Um, I'll let Avishai introduce our principal discussants tonight, and let me just express a gratitude to Avishai Ben Sasson Gordis, uh, who is a government uh, a PhD candidate in Harvard's Department of Government and a research fellow at Molad, which is the Center for Renewal of Israeli Democracy. And he himself has a career uh, military service in, in intelligence as well. Um, and Gabi, uh, as you'll hear, Gabriella Bloom, the Rita Hauser Professor of Human Rights and Humanitarian uh, Law at Harvard Law School, and Tamir Pardo, the most recent past director of Israel's Mossad, are certainly distinguished guests whom I'm very, very glad to welcome to Harvard Hillel and thank all of you for being here this evening for what I, I'm sure will be a fascinating and probably slightly frightening conversation. Well, let's, dive in, let's dive in directly into the conversation with a short introduction since Rabbi Jonah gratefully done, has done most of the work for me. Professor Gabi Bloom is the Rita E. Hauser Professor of uh, Human Rights and Humanitarian Law at the Harvard Law School. She specializes in public international law, international negotiations, the law of armed conflict and counterterrorism. In her recent book, The Future of Violence, Robots, Germs, Hackers, and Drones, Confronting a New Age of Threat, was co-authored with Benjamin Wittes, 
won the Roy C. Palmer Civil Liberties Prize. I recommend that you check it out. Um, and Tamil Pardo served as the most recent director of the Mossad, served there as, um, from 2011 to 2016. And I'm grateful for both of you uh, for joining us here tonight and for you for coming and listening to the conversation. And just to start us off, I'd like to hear from both of you, since you both have a very long career and distinguished career in the world of national security um, and its um, adjoining areas, what's changed in the years you've been doing this in, in terms of security? So clearly much has changed, but if you could maybe point at the things that are not just difference in, in the style of how we do things, but the essence and how it's changed over the time you've done it. And tell me if we could start with you, maybe. Well, the world has changed. First of all, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor to be here uh, this afternoon, tonight, I don't know. And, uh, but today, a few questions. The world has changed. And that's the main problem. The major problem that we're facing these days is that uh, as uh, 64 years old, that uh, when I was uh, around my 30s, we didn't have computers, PCs yet, no uh, smartphone, and uh, we lived in a totally different kind of a world. So we are, unfortunately, uh, being one old man these days, and uh, the major leaderships around the world are more or less at their 50s and more. We used to live in our old world and try to use the tools that were good, efficient, uh, in the old world. But now it's totally different. Totally, totally different. And uh, unfortunately, we still don't have the right tools to meet those challenges. I hope that you found some here. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm sure you did, because we didn't. <clears throat> and it's been serving for 43 years in the IDF, and then uh, for several years in uh, special forces units, and then for 35 years the Mossad. Um, from the basement to the top. I must say that uh, through the years, we saw we failed those changes. We saw I, the day that I entered the office as a director of the Mossad, uh, three weeks, I got an, three weeks in advance the notice that I'm going to be the director. So uh, it was after a year and a half that I um, was trying to do some business. And I came to the intelligence department and asked them, OK, just feed me with the changes that took place in the last year and a half. So I heard that Mubarak grew up and became old in one year. I heard that Bashar was the same. That actually nothing changed during the last, during those term of 18 months or so that I was out of service. Then three day, three weeks after sitting on the third floor of that building, the Mossad, in my office, I heard the news that uh, a young Tunisian um, burned himself, put in the same flame. Because of, um, he couldn't find a job, a proper job, and he was kicked out by a policewoman in the middle of a market. A few days later, we started to see what started to happen, what we used to call the Arab Spring in Egypt, then Libya, then Syria, then actually in every place from the Atlantic Ocean in Morocco up to the Gulf countries, you could have seen it. At the very beginning, we didn't understand what's happening. I would say that now we do understand, but it was a phenomenon. 
And I asked myself for years, in the first two, three years, what really happened and why it happened. And what if we are facing all the changes? It's a long story. I'll make it short. First of all, breaking the equilibrium. The um, war, 2003, that the United States invaded Iraq, broke the equilibrium between Iran and Iraq. That, wa that was something essential to the balance of power within the Middle East. Then we have what we are calling the revolution of the IT, the global, the globalization, the social networks, the things that are happening now here at that corner is transmitted immediately to all the world. In every corner you can see it if you want. And I remember one night after the first uh, big demonstration in Tahrir Square in Cairo, the first one that blocked the capability of their own citizens to um, find something about Egypt was China. So you could type Mubarak, you could type Cairo, and you get nothing in that big China. While well, understanding the 99.9999 of the Chinese having a clue that a place like Egypt exists at all. But the fear of the Chinese was that if they're going to see those kinds of demonstrations because they have, they're suffering from poverty, they don't have a proper job, the middle class is, was ruined actually, that can bring an or instability in, uh, in China. And we can be seen in many, many countries. So the nature of what we see now, I'm going to use the term of the Third World War. I have no idea if we are at the very beginning or towards the end. But what my granddaughters are going to face within 10 or 15 years going to be totally different from what we are facing or what we used to face. I was too long. Now it's your turn. So I think my thoughts are very similar. Let me try and sort of put them in three categories. I think the first is, and Thomas certainly alluded to it, the decline of the centrality of states in our what affects our security environment. Uh, the rise of non-state actors, whether they are organized armed groups or the demonstrators in the Khil Square, uh, all the way to empowered individuals around the globe that either act because they're inspired by something or on their own motivations. And because of the second development, which is technology, they are now empowered to do much more harm than ever before. Uh, with distances and geography becoming less and less relevant. Whether you're talking about cyber attacks, which Tamil alluded to, whether you're talking about bioengineering, or you're talking about drones. That combination means a third development in our normative environment, which is, or historically was so much premised on the idea that you live in a state-based system and that states in some ways are responsible not only for the safety and well-being of their own nationals, but also for any external harm that emanates from their own territory. And they are increasingly unable to do that. They're increasingly unable to police their own territory and act as these subcontractors for the international system uh, to maintain everyone, keep everyone safe. And so you know, one of the things that always puzzled me is was that 
we talk about national security and drones, just to give you one example. And when we talk about drones, we immediately think about targeted killings in Yemen or Pakistan. And this was a huge development back in the early 2000s of this ability to uh, send these remote operations. But you and I can both go online today and purchase a drone. And you can purchase a drone that already comes equipped with a camera. And then making it lethal is the next step, but it's not that complicated. So you see today ISIS, Hamas, Al-Qaeda, Hezbollah, more and more non-state actors employing drones, but you also see increasingly individuals employing drones. And all you need is an iPhone to guide the drone. And you can start doing it from great distances in cyber. You know, you don't need anything. You need a keyboard, basically. And so what does it mean? to think about security in that environment. What you immediately see is sort of the blurring of all the boundaries that we used to think are meaningful. So geographical boundaries are not that meaningful. The, any distinction between what counts as national security and individual security becomes less meaningful, both, by the way, on the side of the targets, but also on the providers of security. Who provides security today? It's Google or the tech companies in some ways as much as the government is. So we have a complete reshuffling and inability to address the sort of intermediary private sector in our security environment. What makes it, what distinguishes criminal activity from belligerent activity? Does it matter? How do we know if somebody operated from, by one motivation, from one motivation or another, and why and when does that matter? Um, and, and there's a sense that war and security are about everything and everywhere. So if there is an intervention, let's assume for the sake of argument that there was a Russian hacking of the elections in the United States, people immediately try and translate it to, okay, is that an act of war? And sort of what can you do? But it immediately also gives you the sense that our paradigms for addressing these questions are just irrelevant. They're not sufficient. Is Tahrir Square, can you, how do you deal with something like that? Is that a national security event? Is it a national security event in Egypt? Is it a national security event in Israel? Uh, how do you deal with the proliferation of WMDs? How do you deal with sporadic terrorist attacks uh, in Europe today? And I think part of the problem is that we've, uh, and let me say just one more thing about the development of norms. I think a lot of good things happened in kind of the evolution of norms, in particularly for some societies, of things that are acceptable and unacceptable. There are certain types and degrees of cruelty that I think today we are less likely to see. Uh, I was just going back, I was watching with my students today the Robert McNamara doc documentary, The Fog of War. And he talks there about the uh, incendiary weapons that were dropped under on Japan that killed far more people than the nuclear bombs. I think in that sense we made progress. It seems less likely to me that we'll witness something like that uh, in the foreseeable future. But we also see a migration of this kind of less appealing normative or, or the things that are, cannot be done by states or certain state get channeled to the non-state world. Uh, so groups like ISIS, Al-Qaeda, or, or uh, others that want to push their agenda. I think the most confusing thing is that everything today is translatable or translated or is talked about as if it is a matter of security. And it's not just a ruse by people like us want to be, have our empires and be important, I think there is a sense that everything is measured through the prism of security, everything affects our personal security, our social security, and that if you frame it like that, you're also likely to get more attention. So there is an invitation to use that language, I think, more than ever before. And that's the biggest mistake. Maybe. <laughs> because I think that we are, when especially in Israel, okay? When we are saying security, we mean not social security, we mean security of the state of Israel, the Hamas, the Hezbollah, okay? Palestinians, that's when we're talking about security. 
But I think when I had, I met one of my colleagues in one of the states in the Middle East countries, and uh, I remember that uh, 2013 or 14, I asked him, uh, tell me why so many people from your country joined ISIS, or who joined ISIS? So I got an answer. All the unhappy people. What do you mean by unhappy people, I asked. So I said, look, there is no middle class, no more middle class in my country. People, young people that are university graduated or high school graduated can't find a job. The father that has to handle his family is unable to fill the fridge, not with caviar, but with simple food, because they don't have a job. The healthcare is in a horrible situation. We're getting nothing. Education, schools are not functioning anymore. The bottom line was, the state cannot support anymore their own citizens because of many reasons. And you're going to find it in many, many countries, not only in the Middle East. That was on one hand. On the other hand, we saw the conglomerates, okay? We saw big, big companies that are, they, they're, with their money, you can run a state. Think about Apple, think about Amazon, think about the big Chinese banks or big Chinese companies. Goes to the two for 2,000 big companies that were selected by Forbes. See what's so called, try to analyze it, to see what's their income, and try to um, see and compare it to the income of other states in the world, you can see that the first 2,000 covered 80 or 85 percent of the whole world by the income that the state can, come, can get from their own citizens. So we are living in a different world. And security is on one hand what you described here, okay? Robot germs, hackers, and drones. And hacking is something very, diff very interesting. Being a hacker, you shouldn't attend Harvard. You can be a bright guy in some small, small village uh, nearby Pyongyang, and you can create a mess all over the world. You can be an ISIS young person that came from the Caucasus and never attended the high school even, and you can be a very, very good hacker. So the new world gives deadly weapon quite easily to people, to countries, to places that don't have any other resources. It's cheaper to uh, find a young girl or young man or young uh, uh, boy, uh, 13 or 14 years old, to invest in him or her $20,000 in education computer, and he can be a hacker less than one hour running a fuel in F-35. And that's the new threat that we're facing, all of us. This is part of it. So would you like to take it up? So, just to explain what I meant when I said everything is security. So um, <clears throat> about a week ago, Stanley McChrystal, who used to be the head of the US Armed Forces in Afghanistan, wrote an op-ed in the New York Times. I don't know if any of you saw it. The op-ed was about PBS, and specifically PBS kids. And he says, PBS kids, is important for our safety and security. 
the education we give our kids, the fact that they get good programming free from commercials is important, is part of our national security. You can't just talk about tanks, you can't just talk about airplanes, this is part of our security. And everything again gets translated to that. Go back to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. If I asked you what is the mission goal in Iraq and Afghanistan, you would say something about enemy forces, military capabilities, maybe affecting some intentions or desires of the regime. That would be in the old world. In the new world, the answer was everything from regime change to democracy, rule of law, education for women, agricultural production, and child literacy. And those were metrics of success that were offered for the question, how do we know we're winning in Afghanistan? How do we know if we're safer? And the answer was women education and child literacy. If we improve those, we would know, and partly because of what you said, when the conditions in the country are unfavorable, you're afraid it's gonna affect your security. And so if today, you went to Washington and wanted to have a conversation about foreign aid. Does the United States provide enough foreign aid or not foreign aid? You can use any moral argument until you're blue in the face. It's not gonna fly, nobody cares. Once you start explaining that that foreign aid is good for our security because it helps create stronger infrastructure, stability, law and order, give opportunities to people, now you've got somebody listening. Maybe it's not gonna fly. President Trump already announced he's closing down USAID, et cetera, but you've ha you have much better chance in getting people's attention than when you talk about tikkun olam or whatever it is. So, I agree. So if I, can, word. so if I can push, push both of you back a bit on this point. This evening started with Rabbi Jonah mentioning how scary this is gonna be. And then we continue to tell people how scary it already is by telling them that people can buy drones off of Amazon and it's enough that something happens in Tunisia and China is destabilized and America has to send their fleet to Taiwan Sea. Um, and yet you're saying, let's not securitize everything. But in a world in which fear is the main political commodity, how do you offer governments corporations, citizens, to behave other than responding to everything is a question of the main currency that we have in politics right now. Right, so in the United States, the annual homicide statistics is somewhere between 13 and 15,000 people a year, okay? How many people die in terrorist attacks? A couple of dozens? Maybe? Yeah, exactly. Probably less. Mm -hmm. Probably less. Probably, here, probably less. Well, it varies yeah. by year, but if you do like a 15 year statistic, 9 11 really changes okay, it, there's a above. peak, but that's what we're talking about. Um, and of course, the amount of resources, political attention, uh, discourse, everything we invest is, goes much more to the war on terrorism than to the war on crime. So for a president to have a terrible a school shooting incident on his watch is very tragic. It's not politically devastating. All he needs to do is immediately issue a lot of support of the NRA and he's fine. But if you have a terrorist attack on your watch, that looks very different. And that is politically uh, devastating especially if it's terrorists whom you already know of, that it's not a new organization, a surprise, that you can say it was unprepared, but it's a threat that you've been aware of and you know. Now, part of it, then you ask, what is the role of government in that case? Ideally, I would say the role of a government is to be the responsible adult in the room and say, this is irrational, we shouldn't be like that. We should divert attention resources where we think is best. But you could also say if you're a democratic country or a democratic government, you respond to people's fears and preferences even if they are irrational. The problem, of course, is that leaders 
like to play on people's fears to consolidate their political power. And this is true not just in the United States, but we can think of other countries where uh, yeah. it works. Some others. Some other <laughs> countries. <laughs> shall remain nameless here. Uh, where None of it, us know that country. <laughs> where it very much works in the, and by the way, beyond any particular country too. It's not uh, a, a unique invention. Uh, but, but leaders play off of fears and it's very uh, likely. Now, I, I just wanna go back to one thing you said when I, you said don't securitize everything. I'm not, I don't have a normative view on that. I think we do live in a world where globalization and things that like human security or the strength and resilience of our society do really mean that everything is security. So I don't think it's a completely contrived notion. I think it's a fact that makes everything more complicated. Um, once, I, a few months ago, I met an old Russian colleague. <laughs> and uh, I asked him, what the hell is going on in Syria? Okay, what's going to be the end state? So he said, okay, at the end state, more or less, uh, uh, Bashar will control 50, 30, 40% of the state of Syria, and uh, everything will relax after then. So I said, okay, 500,000 people were killed. The majority of the Syrian uh, are refugees, whether in their own country or uh, in Europe, in the surrounding countries, in the Middle East. So what the hell are you going to do? So uh, it was not an official because I already retired and he was not an official, so it was uh, quite an interesting discussion. So I said, uh, I'm sure that uh, President Putin will not invest even one ruble in order to uh, uh, invest and to uh, bring Syria to the old time, okay? Very poor country, okay, at the end of the day. But now, it doesn't exist anymore. So who gonna invest in uh, Syria? The United States of America? The European? At the end of the day, the Events in Syria started because this country became poorer and poorer. Because the central government, because of very good reasons, was, not, was unable to support their own population. At the end of the day, Syria is a civil war between families, not even between tribes. There are Sunnis against Sunnis. There are Alawites against Alawites. So at the end of the day, then I saw my, some of my colleagues here and in Europe and asked them, look, instead of investing money in Germany, in Europe, in order to give some shed and some education and job in those places, put the money in Syria, invest in Syria. If you, if you could have seen some investment there, or at least an understanding that investment should be put later on, I think we could shorten that war. And Egypt, take another place. We're talking about Egypt, they're gonna be 100 million in a few years from now. It's a very poor country. The majority of people under the age of 30 can't find jobs. I can see instability that can lead maybe to a third revolution that no one wants to see. Who try to do something to avoid it or to stop it? I must tell you, no one. No one. There's 
economic situation in Egypt is deteriorating from year to year. And the threat to the stability of this country is getting greater and greater as time is passing. We can say, we can talk about Jordan. So we can talk about Gaza. And let's I, start. <laughs> because again, it goes to this, how, how much should we see things through the prism of security? And what happens when you don't see enough things through the prism of security? So I remember when I, uh, was uh, working in the Israeli National Security Council and Israel just uh, was preparing for the disengagement plan from Gaza and parts of the West Bank. And one of the, this was back when Gaza was controlled by Fatah and there were, there were part of the projects we were dealing with were the passages from Gaza to Israel post disengagement, uh, how these passages will operate for people, for commodities, uh, etc. And in every conversation you would walk into, where you had the Shabak, the ISA, or you had police, or you had military, it was always, how do we balance the economic interest of the Palestinians with Israel's security interests? And that was a, fail, a failure to understand what Tamim was just talking about, a complete failure to make that balance between their economic interests and our security. The moment you don't, you fail to understand that in this kind of proximity, closing the door and saying, I don't care what happens then, I'm just maintaining my security. It's like living next to a volcano and thinking that if you shut the windows, you're safe. And that was another way of saying sometimes we don't consider enough interest as security, exactly as Tamil suggests. For instance, inventing, in, investing sorry, in, in humanitarian, economic, development projects, uh, you know, it's much easier politically to buy a few more aircraft and show them off and explain that you spent money on that. The moment you start spending money on humanitarian causes, people ask you, hang on, well, uh, you have enough people domestically who need this money, why are you doing that? So, well, you know, in Israel, the shekel is the Israeli currency. But the Central Bank of Israel actually is working with three separate entities with the same currency. Israel, okay. the West Bank, and Gaza. All of them are using the same currency with a big but. The GDP per capita in Israel is around, let's say, I'm talking about between 36 to 38 thousand dollars per year. In the West Bank is less than 3,000. In Gaza is less than 1,000. So you cannot create stability with that gap. And if I'm saying the one of the biggest threat the Zionist dream is when those people in Gaza and the West Bank are going to say, we don't want <laughs> two, two states. states, want one state. If you remember East Germany and West Germany, the difference between GDP per capita there was smaller than what we have here in our country. And those where the greatest benefit was the Eastern, because yes, the total, the GDP per capita when the, after the unification of Germany went down by a couple of thousands of Deutsche Mark or Euros those time, but later on, it became almost equal, even though there is still differences, but it's not a huge difference as it used to be. So when those people there are going to say, no, we don't want any more two-state solution, from my point of view, that's going to be the end of Zionism. So this, this might be a point well worth drilling into. And I'm going to ask my last question now, and then I'm going to turn to you. Feel free to ask whatever you want. It doesn't have to continue on the vein of our conversation. Uh, as long as it's a question. Um, no, why? I would so, like to see the, not, see the answers. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so tell me you can have, you can give him the lectures, but if you'd like to ask Gabi that, then that's a question. Um, I'll ask one final question, you, trying to dig into a theme that arose in, in what you both just talked about. Um, you mentioned the interest, the security interests states, dem democracies might have in looking for the welfare of others. And I looked at data today for whatever reason about um, the opinions the Israeli public has on a variety of issues. And one of them is, is Israel better off fighting its wars and trying to protect, to protect its security interests as a democracy? And a majority of Israelis, and I imagine the same is true in the US, believe that we're handicapped by it and we're actually worse off trying to conduct our, our security interests as democracies. As two people who have both been asking themselves question of operations, legality, morality, does it align with our values? I'd like to hear your take on this. Do you believe that we're better served doing this as democracies? If so, how? So in democratic countries, we're accustomed to think about these question, questions as a balancing act. It's a balance between uh, security and liberty, or security and privacy. If you really thought it was a balancing act, that you give a little bit of one, you, uh, you have to give something in return, <coughs> the safest country in the world would be North Korea, and the freest country in the world would be Somalia. Now, we don't think about it in those terms, right? Because we think, and, and that tells us something that this balancing metaphor, there's something wrong about it. There is no liberty without security. That we know, when you don't feel safe, when you don't have personal safety, when you don't have national security, you're not at liberty to do anything. It's also the case that absolute security means we're all jailed in little uh, cells, monitored 24 hours a day. And at that somebody's point- Somebody's reading our emails. Somebody's reading our emails, that's right. Uh, and at that point, security is not, you don't have any liberty and security itself becomes a little bit less desirable. So I don't know what that question means because the answer is, if being, if the, the price I have to pay for better security is not being a democracy, I don't want to live there. And that's all I can say. Would well, you agree. like to address? Oh, I agree. Simple as that. If Israel won't be a democracy, I don't think I would like to live there. There. Is. Don't stop. I don't. I don't. Th I don't believe that um, the sec my security is my democracy. If I won't be able to think, to talk, to say, to do, to drive, to find a job, I don't want to live there. I don't know where but I don't want to live there. While well, talking about uh, something interesting that happening these days, or during the last few years, that people stop believing in the system. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, um, I don't know, um, there was an argument here in the United States uh, with Apple to give the NSA mm, the back door, yeah. the back door, and uh, and uh, Apple said no. Why? Why Apple said no? They were right or wrong? Because when I'm downloading a stupid application on my iPhone, and I said when they are requester. I uh, press yes, 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 because I want to play that game. So the yes, yes, yes is that now this small company that I have no idea where they are situated are retrieving everything from my iPhone. So I let them to do to me, I give them the key to my home, to my safe. But I don't want to give it to the NSA 
to stop a terrorist attack. So we believe in those small companies or big companies, what we don't believe in our country. And I am saying, fine, I can live with it. Because it's totally different to give the access to a, a company from somewhere than to give an access to my government, they're going to see what I'm doing at home. Even though this application can be run by the Chinese or the Russians. Okay? But you really doesn't. So I prefer the bottom line to live in democracy and to tell Apple, be quiet, and to tell the NSA, if you want something, go to court. And if court will decide, okay, you'll have to give it. But don't volunteer. Do you want to add something before we turn to the audience? No. So your audience? Here, I see we have someone with a microphone. Feel free to step up. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank you um, for coming and speaking with us. Um, and concerning your comment about um, how we get to a state, an insecure state, when um, the government can no longer provide for its people. I mean, you're talking about Egypt um, with people not being able to find jobs. Just in terms of overpopulation as a general global issue, how can countries provide support that may come in the form of natural resources? If you look into Syria with the drought, um, that was a big driver of um, clashes that contributed to the civil war. How do you address these natural forces in overpopulation? The U.S. Fund for Peace is a uh, Washington-based think tank, and every year, a couple of years, they issue their index of states, uh, ranking them from the sort of very effective government to those with, uh, they say, a high, an alert or a high alert. They don't call them failed states because that's not nice, but countries we should be on alert or high alert. And out of 193 UN members, about 40 or 45 on that list are considered on alert or high alert, meaning a quarter of the world's countries have a problem of governance that often means incapacity to provide essential services to the local population, inability to provide law and order, but also access to medicine or um, health care, education, et cetera, et cetera. Now, why that is, there are numerous forces uh, ranging from uh, natural disasters to uh, how many natural resources to weak governments, corruption, even rules of international trade that favor very much the developed world over the developing world. So there are a lot of forces that contribute to this, um, to this problem. Some of it, some of them are in our hands to change, for instance, trade rules, and we're not exactly moving in that direction. Uh, and some of them are through uh, redistribution of benefits or redistribution of um, wealth. It's not that simple. So the moment you consider, for instance, government corruption, okay, there's a big question then on how do you do it? How do you redistribute benefits in a way that makes sure that these benefits reach the right targets or that is used for the right purposes. There are no kind of silver bullets, oh, it's so easy, we should just do it. The problems are real. Population overgrowth you can treat by, you know, or advi advice education is shown to be correlated with lower uh, uh, population growth or slower population growth. Uh, frankly, the civil society or at least the private donors, thing like the, things like the, the big funds of the Gates Foundation, Warren Buffett, those kinds of people do more to address these problems than most governments. Uh, so it's not a satisfying answer, but it's just I don't think there's one thing that you can uh, sort of focus the problem on. I think that um, the tools that 
were found after the Second World War. Their validity, for me, is a big question mark. Marshall Plan, that was launched after the Second World War in Europe, was great. Helped Europe, assisted Europe after the Second World War, that disaster. But now, the United Nations doesn't function in the way they should, because we need something different. We need another, I, I'm using the old term, but we should find the right term for something like Marshall Program. I think that there is enough money in the world to make it better. And there are ways to do it. And there are ways to convince those 43 that are in a, let's say they have failed state, okay, use my, use my term, but there are many others that are not in good condition. Okay, and we are talking about the majority of the countries around the world are in a very bad situation. So, and with all the miracles that we are able to extend life, that people can live more, in a very, very poor countries, it's happening. And they don't have resources. Revolution in agriculture, in water, in climate. There are many things that should be done, and there are enough resources to do it. But unfortunately, governments today still trying to use their old principles and their old tools that were effective 30, 40, even 25 years ago, but are not effective at all these days. So until it will be changed, and I hope it will be changed, otherwise we're going to face a real disaster in this planet that all of us are living on. That's, that's going to be our, that's going to be your young people here. That's going to be your job. One, let's do one. Oh, you've got a, you've got a queue going, so go right ahead. Great. Hi, my name is Shana Wasserman, and I work for J Street. So I want to thank you so much for what you said, and I want to follow up on your comments about the two-state solution. Um, if you know anything about J Street, you know it's something we care deeply about, and I'm really glad to hear you say, glad and sad, but glad to hear you say that um, you think that without a two-state solution, it'll be the end of Zionism. So that's something that, um, so as I said, at J Street, we deeply believe also. But my question to you is, when the facts on the ground are that, for whatever reason, the current Israeli leadership is not willing to make the hard compromises um, that are necessary to get to a two-state solution. So that's issue one. And issue two is that it seems that while when polled, most of Israelis living in Israel want a two-state solution, it's not the top of their list. They care about other things, such as socioeconomic issues. So given that um, they seem sort of complacent, and I know I'm generalizing, but they seem sort of complacent with the status quo and they're not feeling an urgency to move towards a two-state solution. How do you reconcile those challenges with your statement about the necessity of a two-state solution? You want to start? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cute. It was your comment. Uh, <laughs> it was your comment, own it. <laughs> B- basically, if I can rephrase the question, she's asking, it's hard. What do you suggest to do about it? And, and I don't think that's belittling the question. It's a fair question, given the importance of the issue. We are, we in Israel, we are facing a very big problem that must realize I, I should go a bit back to history in order to, that you'll understand my answer. 
in 47, Ben-Gurion and Israeli leadership agreed upon dividing the territory between the Mediterranean and the Jordan Valley that uh, we got uh, less than 40% of the area, correct? 49, I think, was in uh, no, Resolution 181. No, less than 40. Including okay. the Golan. Le much less than 40. Okay. Less than 40. And we agreed, even though uh, the heart in that territory that the promised land was not in our hands. The promised land is the West Bank. Okay? At the end of the day, those places, okay, were much more important as a Jewish heritage than places like Caesarea or uh, 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 many places along the coastline. Abraham was in Hebron, okay? At the 6-7 war, we got it. There was a government then, a bipartisan government, the Labour Party and Menachem Begin with Gachal. They never annexed this area. Why? It was a promised land, because from their point of view, if we would have annexed that area, we couldn't have a majority on the long run. Because the Palestinians that were living in the West Bank in Gaza stayed there after the Six-Day War. So, the Israeli government for 50 years, other than 40 years more or less, under right-wing governments, never annexed the West Bank. Not talking about Gaza, okay, leave Gaza aside. Never did it. Never tried to do it. Why? Because I think the majority of the Israelis, the Jewish people in Israel, thought that by annexing the, that territory, we're going to lose the Zionist dream because it won't be a majority. That's on one hand. On the other hand, it was a promised land. To give up that territory it's a very, very hard decision from the psychological point of view, from the emotional point of view. You know that you are not doing the right thing and you cannot do the right thing. That's on one side. On the other side, as I said more than once, that uh, give to Mr. Abu Mazen or any other a Palestinian leader, pick whoever you want. And I said, put this, take this paper right here, peace agreement between Israel and the Palestinians. Leave an empty page at the bottom, sign Benjamin Netanyahu or any other prime minister, and let him take this, fill it. I already signed it. He wouldn't be able to do it must understand, he would know no Palestinian leader will be able to sign, to write a peace agreement between Israel and this second state, call it Palestine. So both sides are playing, it's not, they're not playing a game. To write a peace agreement to both sides this date, it's an impossible mission, unfortunately. Everyone has its own good reasons. 
And that's a point, and that's a sad point. But I think that in order to lower the flames, to stop this hatred between the two societies, we must start to do something different. Not to deal with security, to do with economy. To start with economy. Because I believe that, for instance, in Gaza, there are two million people living in a small basin that is twice as big as the Kinneret. That's the size of Gaza. Surrounded by water on one side, by Israel, let's say, almost the rest, and a small corridor to Egypt. When, if, Gaza will get enough support that I'm going to call it, we'll say it as like something like um, Monte Carlo, okay? I'm going to see their buildings, port, airfield, power stations, university, Cornish, whatever, those people will have something to lose because they know that they have no chance in a war with Israel at the end of the day. They don't have even one tank, one aircraft, one chopper, one armored vehicle. They have not. We have everything. So they know that they can't win. But when their back is to the wall or to the water, people are doing stupid things. And they're hurting themselves more than hurting us. But it's a vicious circle. I think to get out from that vicious circle, we should start with economy. And when the hatred won't stand as it's stand now. And when people will start to believe that it's possible to manage a two-state solution, then both leaders, whoever it's gonna be, will be able to sign something. And maybe it will come from outside. Maybe someone will force both sides to uh, compromise. Because at the end of the day, um, any peace, each side will have to compromise. And to change, not the dreams, but understand that we cannot fulfill our dream, we have to face reality. And if we want to keep our Zionist dream, we need a Jewish state, not a multinational that today 50% of the population is non-Jewish between the Mediterranean and the Jordan Valley. So if we won't act fast enough, we may lose everything. Let's take a couple of questions. Let's take three questions and then go to the end because we have to finish soon. So let's take three last questions. And you can answer them at whatever order you feel. Hi, my name is Jesse Lempel. I'm a first year uh, law student at the law school. Um, thank you for speaking to us. Uh, my question is to you, Director Pardo, but perhaps you can answer as well. Um, you should answer. <laughs> as your lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so in this country, there has been a lot of talk recently about, uh, about the relationship between the intelligence community and the elected uh, leaders. You know, in what, to what extent does the elected leaders actually control the intelligence agency? You know, do they at times have a mind of their own and sometimes even sabotage uh, the elected officials? Um, I was wondering if you could speak about that um, as it exists, you know, your perspective on that um, in general, maybe in Israel, and maybe from personal experience. 
Great. So let's pick up two more questions. Let's uh, wait, wait. You want an answer? You want it? I think I we'll, want to remember. Okay. <laughs> I've been overruled. Old man. It's very simple. In Israel, all the agencies are professional agencies. We say what we think. We say what we believe based on our facts that we are gathering. And we are telling our government exactly that. There is no, in Israel, there is no politicization of intelligence. But there is a distinction. We are nominated. They are, we are voting, they are elected. So at the end of the day, I can say whatever I want in the right place, but they have to take the decision, not me. That's a democracy, okay? And I believe it should remain like that. There are many other countries, democracies, that they are manipulating the intelligence. But I believe that we are not, that we are, whenever I met the government, the prime minister, he always heard exactly what I thought based on the intel that we gathered. And then he had to take a decision. That's the rules of the game. Very simple, very neat. And the Prime Minister Netanyahu worked exactly on the same those rules without any problem. It was a fair game from day one to the last day in my office. Let's. Uh, there's one, only one more question though. Okay. Hi, Sasha Belenke. I'm a second year master's student at the Kennedy School. Uh, I had the privilege recently of helping to lead the Kennedy School Israel trek. We took 100 students to Israel. Uh, a few of them are here. Uh, and while there, we, we also went to Ramallah and we met with uh, Jibril Rajoub, who uh, made a very interesting comment. He's the uh, former head of security for Fatah. Uh, he was asked by a student what his uh, greatest um, mistake was in dealing with the Israelis. And he said that he underestimated the extent to which security for Israelis is not just physical security, but psychological, uh, which was uh, very interesting to hear from him. I wonder if you think that that's more true for Israel than, for Israelis than uh, people of other nations, uh, how that changes, if so, how that changes your job, and how we can begin to shift Israelis to value uh, economic security and the uh, long-term physical, physical security that, that brings, uh, which leads uh, a little bit to the last idea question. On it. I'll start, but you, uh, she wants you to answer. No, no, no. No, actually both. Uh, so I, I wanted to comment on, in response to your comment earlier uh, from J Street on uh, Israelis are more interested in socioeconomic issues. I think that's actually wrong. I think when they vote in elections in Israel, it's all about security. And in fact, they vote the opposite of what their economic interests would dictate because somebody is quote unquote tough on the Arabs or tough on terror. And that is much more than takes precedence over any other. So why, is, why are Israelis more uh, paranoid, scared, haunted, wherever it is? First of all, they are at a greater risk. Just as a factual matter, let's not forget the number of rockets aimed at any given moment at Israel is higher than anywhere else around the world. Am I wrong about that in numbers? No, South no. Korea? No, I think- I think we like, might be leading. I think we're number. leading there. <laughs> There's a long history of, even if you leave sort of Holocaust legacy, I think is a big part of it, but the sort of persecuted Jew, the homeland that is from day one attack, uh, there is a threat perception, much of it is genuine. And you know, when I teach students and I talk about the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, we have these moral conversation about protecting Iraqi civilians, Afghan civilians, the difference between civilians and combatants, the governments versus the, the, the individual. And it's very easy for my American students to understand these rules. But it's also easy for them to sort of understand and apply them because most of them have never been to these places. 
if you don't have a family member serving, you have no connection to the armed forces, the war takes place thousands of miles away and does never implicate the societies in a way that it implicates in, in Israel. In Israel, if you live in Israel, you've been at war. To war, at war, a lot of people serve, but even if you didn't serve, at one, as an adult, at one point in your lifetime, you heard the sirens and you had to seek shelter and your area was attacked. And that is a very, very different experience from being an American or being English or being French that their last experience with war ended in 1945. And since then, their experience with war is exactly the American experience. You send troops to Mali in the French case or to Afghanistan and Iraq in the British case, and you get the occasional terrorist attack on, on your streets. It's not an everyday, pervasive, universal experience in your daily life. So in Scandinavia, the news, the first item on the news is climate change. It's not because they're morally better and they really care about the planet. It's because for them, that is the most urgent topic. In Israel, it won't be the first item on the news. And there's a good reason for that. And it's not because Israelis don't, are not warm and fuzzy enough to care about the climate. It is because there are existential Every day, when I mean existential, I'm not talking about you know nuclear annihilation by Iran, etc. It's existential in the sense of how do you run a functioning society that wants both liberty and security, that wants to feel safe, but also you know has other interests or other obligations, and that's why I think it's a completely different idea uh, for Israelis to talk about security than any sort of need more neat categorization that you can say it goes in here, it doesn't affect that. I would like to add something. It's, it's a bit unfair. Well, we had a 52 days war round with, in Gaza two years ago. I was in service those days. We heard sirens few times a day in Tel Aviv. When they launched their rockets, they couldn't le care less where it's gonna land. On a kindergarten, on a hospital, or a school, whatever, was a good target. When we conducted the war against them, I must tell you, as being part in in that arena, more than half of the time, targets were checked not to hit civilians and non-participants in that war. That was the reason that many bad guys were not hit, because they got sheltered nearby kids, in high school, in hospitals, and elsewhere. There are those who try to find similarities in the way Israel conduct a war and the Palestinians conduct a war. There is no similarity at all, okay? We are the moral and the IDF is something you won't find in any other army in the world, including the United States, the US forces. Because we are finding, let's say, five kilometers or three kilometers from our house, from our home. We are not fighting 2,000 miles from here, from our home. We are very careful. Mistakes are done. But we are judged not in a similar way that other countries judging their people or their soldiers or their forces in the war. I think that there are many mistakes are done. We're trying to correct them. 
It's not that we are the bad guys in this, let's say, conflict. It's a two to tango. And uh, you, you must understand, there are many things that are said around the world, and even within the Jewish community. I got family in a kibbutz that is nearby Gaza Strip. I'm for, from the 2005, even before then, the kids there were grew, grew up in shelters, not because we did something. We did nothing. It's not simple. I think we must find a solution. And I believe in two-state solution. I think that's the right thing. Not because I'm, let's say, a good man. I think it's for the Zionist dream that should fulfill a two-state solution. But don't be incorrect. They are playing a very, very immoral game. So we'll have to conclude with this. But thank you very much. Uh, and, and Director Pardo's staff is telling me he has to get to the airport. So we're really under, yeah. uh, under time pressure. Yeah. Just before we sat down, I saw on my iPhone, aptly enough, uh, and probably mo some of you know more than, than I gathered from the, from the news update that you know, someone jumped out of a car on the Champs-Elysees in, in France and uh, killed at least one police officer and some other people. Mechanically, you know, what happened there could have happened four decades ago, someone jumping out of a car and, and killing a police officer. The, the world in which that happened today, you know, how that person is connected with his world and what his act means in this world is, as our guests have been saying, a totally different situation than ever before. Um, I, I know we haven't come to conclusions, I didn't think we would tonight, but the reason I find it really encouraging to have these conversations where we're privileged to have them is because I know that some of the people in this room, and I'm talking about the audience, um, and I'm talking about the young people in particular who are part of this community are going to be shaping uh, the world in which, uh, in which we'll all live going forward, and it really behooves us to have the smartest conversations that we possibly can. And so I'm tremendously grateful to our guests and to our moderator, Rav Todot. Thank you so very much.